Hi. Don't be alarmed at this American voice popping up. You're in the right place. Philip will be along with the history of European theater in just a tick. At the moment, he's busy talking to my listeners. We've arranged a sort of an exchange, doing promo spots on each other's podcasts. So, while he's over at my place, so to speak, I'm sitting in his chair, talking to you. My name is Peter Schmitz, and I write, produce, and narrate a show called Adventures in Theater History, Philadelphia. On this show, we try and bring you the best stories from the deep and fascinating history of the theater in the city of brotherly love. We start in the 18th century, when Philadelphia was the theater capital of the young American Republic. We really dive into things in the 19th century, when besides being home to such American stars as Edwin Forrest and Louisa Lane Drew, the city played host to such visiting European actors as Fanny Kemble, Edmund Keane, Sarah Bernhardt, and Henry Irving. It was the early home of John, Ethel, and Lionel Barrymore, the famous acting family that you have likely heard of. In the 20th century, Philadelphia was often the starting place for Broadway shows, trying out before going on to New York, which is why such American classic plays as Death of a Salesman, Guys and Dolls, and A Streetcar Named Desire actually had their world premieres in Philadelphia. There are so many other stories to tell, and, well, we try and tell them all, and we have a lot of fun doing it. We mix in a lot of music and use the voices of local actors, and since I'm a former actor myself, I often try out all my best accents and my funny voices, too. You can find us on every podcasting app. Search for Adventures in Theater History. Oh, and being Americans, we spell theater with an E-R at the end of the word. Oh, Okay, now I hear Phil coming back. I think he's done talking to my folks, and he's got another lovely and well-researched and erudite show for you. Enjoy the history of European theater. And when you're done, come on over and check us out, too. Look for Adventures in Theater History, Philadelphia, wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast, and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 98, Marlowe's Mighty Line. Last time wasn't quite the usual biographical episode, but that is because Christopher Marlowe's story is quite different from any other playwrights. For centuries, the exact circumstances of his death, his personality, his proclivities, and the power of his plays have fascinated and divided critics. Inevitably, the fascination with his life, which at some times has been portrayed in very lurid ways, has become conflated with his work. I'm going to try to avoid this, or at least the worst excesses of it, but although my promise to you as I closed the last episode was that we would begin to look at his plays, I find that I have to put this off for one more episode. Despite having covered some aspects of Marlowe's life in some detail, there is still more to say that, I think, is relevant to an understanding of his plays and the position he holds amongst the Elizabethan playwrights and poets. Also, much of what there is to say about Marlowe's poetic technique and the qualities of his imagination sets us up for what is to come in subsequent decades. He was very much at the start of some very big changes. So in this episode, I'm going to try to bring in several threads that complete the picture of Marlowe's life and the times he lived in. This will involve some mention of his plays, but it will be with the next episode that I start the detailed look at his greatest works. This also reflects the fact that in the chronology of the podcast we have arrived at a time when there are more records available to us, and therefore more to be said about the life, times and motivations of the playwrights, the performers and the theatre people in general. These records are incomplete and imperfect, of course, and untangling the biases and the motivations of their authors can be tricky, but that is, I think, half of the fun of the slow and detailed look at the subject. The pace of the chronology of the podcast will probably slow down from here on in, and I hope that you, like me, think that that's a good thing. I'm in no rush and I hope that you're ready to come along for the ride. And I don't have any problem with justifying a long and slow look at Marlowe's work. He was a brilliant playwright who, if it were not for the long shadow of Shakespeare over the period, could be seen as the greatest Elizabethan playwright. It's a matter of opinion, of course, 
Johnson and, and possibly Kidd, but for his limited output, could also be contenders for that title. But, I would argue, Marlowe took the work of playwriting forward in a way that was unique to him, and so, for me, he is a real turning point. A point where Elizabethan theatre changed into something truly great. He didn't do that alone, and others improved on what he did. But I'll happily argue that he led the way for those others, and had the skills and talent to turn the theatre of the university students, of the Inns of Court set, and of the Queen's Court, into something vibrant and visceral that attracted the Elizabethan mass audiences. We should remember that theatre was incredibly popular. In London, it's estimated that two-thirds of the population regularly attended the theatre, week in, week out. Plays were required to feed that demand at an incredible rate. Many were, no doubt, potboilers and lacklustre comedies, and we can but assume that it is only the very best from the period that have survived. We tend to reserve the word genius for Shakespeare alone in the period, but Marlowe is at least close to that, and had he had more time, who knows what his talents might have led to. And before we get going, just a small warning that there's a section coming up soon where I discuss the question of Marlowe's sexual preferences and the general Elizabethan attitude towards sexuality. If that isn't something that you want to hear, then just jump forward about six minutes when I introduce the subject. To briefly recap and clarify something that I think I fudged a little in the last episode, Kit Marlowe, son of a shoemaker, went to Cambridge University on a scholarship. He graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1584 without any issues that we know of, and then went on to study for a Master's degree, and it's during this period that he was absent, abroad, and likely on the Queen's business. He also translated Ovid during that time, which takes us to 1587 when the college authorities blinked at granting his degree until the assurances of the Privy Council had been received. Little detail is known of Marlowe's movements at the time, but it's assumed that he quickly made it to London and was based there for the rest of his life. From this period, there are stories of violent behaviour, including a street brawl where a knife was drawn. He is often referred to as a smoker, presumably as a means of indicating that he had exotic tastes, and the accusations of atheism bubble up. Robert Greene later reported that Marlowe had declared directly to him that there was no God. But Greene was bitter and dying at the time, so as ever with Greene, we have to treat the report cautiously. By the end of 1587, Marlowe's first great play, Tamblaine the Great, was being performed, but despite its success, Marlowe's life in London remains mostly mysterious. Absences for his clandestine work might explain much of that, but it's also at least partly due to the low regard in which playwrights were held. Many wrote plays anonymously and didn't seek or gain much fame for playwriting. It's startling to think that we only know that Thomas Kidd wrote The Spanish Tragedy, which he did sometime between 1582 and 1598, because of a later mention of it with Kidd as the author, by Thomas Hayward in 1612. Likewise for Marlowe, the first formal credit he gets as author of Tamburlaine, one of the most popularly performed plays of the time, was in 1609. The root of this anonymity for playwrights probably comes from the fact that plays were regarded as transitory entertainments. They were good for earning money if you had the skill and could produce them at speed, but they were nothing that was going to remember you to the ages. That was your translations of the ancients or your own poetry. Records from the time show the Earl of Leicester's men coming to an agreement with Roland Broughton for 18 plays over a two and a half year period, none of which have survived, so we assume they were populist crowd pleasers with parts geared towards the skills of the actors in that troupe. The payment for a new play was about £6, but with no further control or interest of the playwright. Actually that's not too bad, and a poet who could churn out several plays a year could make a perfectly good living. It took a few decades for playwrights to become more appreciated, with printed editions of the plays published towards the turn of the century often bearing the name of the author. There is also a suggestion that a really successful playwright could be in receipt of the income from the second day's performance of their play, and such an agreement might have earned the playwright a good additional wage. The first record of earnings from a performance of Dr Faustus shows takings of £3.06. The exact interpretation of income figures like this is a bit tricky, 
but profit-sharing would, in time, become a common inducement for playwrights. Marlowe was never a writer of potboilers. Undoubtedly, he aimed his work at the mass audiences. His plays tell action-packed stories of great but flawed men in exotic settings. But he also wrote for those interested in history, and he did it in language that aspired to the literary and the poetic. Like the other great playwrights of the period, he found a way to appeal to a broad section of society in a way that has never been achieved since. As I mentioned last time, precise dating of Marlowe's work is difficult, but it's generally accepted that his first dramatic work was The Tragedy of Dido, Queen of Carthage, which was written between 1587 and 1593. The primary source of the play, which is quite short, was Virgil's Aeneid, but there are some significant diversions from Virgil which appear to be of Marlowe's own creation. The story is of Dido's intense love for Aeneas, his callous betrayal of her and her suicide when he leaves for Italy. The ending is particularly dramatic, with Dido throwing herself onto a pyre of everything that reminded her of Aeneas. In grief, her sister and suitor follow her example. The early printed edition from 1594 credits Thomas Nash as co-author, but modern scholarship sees his contribution as very slight. There hasn't been any decisive agreement on linguistic proof of Nash's involvement, but some aspects of the play do suggest a collaborator's hand, or at least some thematic guidance. To have a female character dominating a play, as Dido does, is unique in Marlowe's canon, and scholars also point out that the centrality of a heterosexual passion is another unique point for a Marlowe play. Perhaps this is the hand of Nash, steering the young Marlowe away from some very controversial territory. That printed edition also says that the play was performed by the Children of Her Majesty's Chapel, which was the troupe of boy actors that I mentioned before, particularly in connection with John Lilly's plays. And now, let's address the question of Marlowe's alleged homosexuality and get that out of the way. Was Marlowe gay? Certainly, this is implied by contemporary or near-contemporary reports about Marlowe, but there are immediately problems in accepting this as a clear-cut matter. We've already seen how accusations of immoral behaviour of one sort or another were commonly thrown about in an attempt to smear rivals, the concept of slander being much less developed than it is now. So the comments on his sexual preferences could have been just that. Scholars also suggest that the Elizabethan concept of homosexuality was very different from ours. A person would not have been seen as being of one particular persuasion or another, as was the case, say, in Victorian and post-Victorian periods. But most likely, contemporary commentators were referring to specific acts, not a fixed state of being. In the period... The terms heterosexual and homosexual didn't exist, and the attitude to male same-sex relationships was probably very fluid. In some poetry of the time, male-to-male desire is expressed quite explicitly, and more often somewhat obliquely. But this doesn't mean that a physical sexual relationship was desired or expected between poet and muse or patron. Men frequently shared beds for practical reasons of warmth, space and cost, and there was no implication of anything more than a platonic friendship. In letters, friends wrote of affectionate feelings that were sometimes placed in what we would see as erotic tones. But again, as with the poetry, that didn't imply physical sexual desire. Friends were expected to be physically affectionate, so to see men embracing, even kissing each other, would not have been uncommon. But given this public and private closeness, It's frankly impossible to say how often some sexual desires were acted on in private. Homosexuality was certainly something that couldn't be flaunted in public, but it's noticeable that the concept of being gay, bisexual or gender fluid didn't exist and homosexuality is rarely explicitly mentioned. However, it was illegal thanks to the rather directly titled Buggery Act of 1530. The Act made homosexual acts illegal and punishable by death because they were, as the Act puts it, unnatural against the will of God. It's really only through the wording of this Act and accusations made of male relationships resulting from it that we get any idea of the Elizabethan attitude to homosexuality. Lesbian relationships are never mentioned. 
But after the introduction of the Act, it seems pretty clear that many such accusations were made for other reasons. Where two men of different social class were seen to be in a close relationship, or where one party was seen to be in a relationship for money, then an accusation of immoral acts was far more likely to be made than when men of the same social class were seen to be in a close relationship. In a similar way, such accusations were often levelled at already marginalised and unpopular groups. The Italian merchants in London, for example, were often accused of immoral practices in the context of the Act. But the accusers can often be seen to have had more than a little self-interest in bringing down the competition. At Cambridge, Marlowe had been exposed to the writings of ancient Greece and particularly of ancient Rome, where the attitude to same-sex relationships was again very different. Aristotle's treatise, called Problems, deals quite explicitly with the reasons for and the practicalities of male same-sex relationships and male-to-female relationships where men enjoy a passive role, something that was also seen as unnatural to the Tudor mind. Works by Cicero and Virgil and Plato added to this with discussions on pederastry, which was often discussed in a positive way, and the benefits of platonic but close male relationships that change as they mature over time. The university student of the Elizabethan period could come away from these newly discovered works with the impression that these great authors thought of homosexual activity with something close to indifference, as simply the way some people were. And, for some balance, I think it's useful here to mention attitudes towards heterosexual relationships. As I've said, the term didn't exist, but a husband and a wife with biological offspring was considered the norm and the desired state for the vast majority of people. The institution of marriage was the means by which male-to-female relationships were managed, but the focus was always on the way that marriage helped to control female desires. Women, the common thought went, were hopelessly tainted by Eve's original sin, which in turn led to a female insatiable desire for sex. To control this, sex was to be restricted entirely for the purposes of procreation within marriage. There were many restrictions relating to when, in what condition and in what manner women were allowed to partake in sex with their husband, some of which was dictated by the church. So, for example, married couples were not allowed to partake in that way during the seasons of Advent and Lent, and on feast days, which of course, up to the Reformation, there were an awful lot. So, I'm not here to say if the Elizabethans were hung up on sex or not, but all the rules about marital sex seem to have been just about as complicated as the ideas on homosexual acts, but without the severe punishment for transgression. And I guess it goes without saying, but the rules were weighted to the advantage of men. The records abound with mentions of adulteries and concerns about the scale of prostitution, so clearly extramarital sex of one sort or another was a thing for the Tudors, as it has been, I would venture, since the institution of marriage was invented. From my reading, most commentators take the view that as many Elizabethans who followed the rules broke them, and male adultery was particularly common. Of course, it was a different story for women. A man who suspected his wife of adultery could physically beat her without any fear of being hauled before a magistrate, unless he actually killed her. Clearly, an appalling situation for women, which must have functioned as a significant deterrent for a married woman with an attraction to a man who was not her husband. Questions about Marlowe and his sexuality will come up again, as most of his plays touch on the subject in one way or another. But that's quite enough of all that stuff for the moment. Marlowe has also generated some strong opinions about his religious views and his philosophy. He was accused by some of being an atheist, by others of having Catholic sympathies. Both accusations may have arisen as a result of his spying work that I covered in the last episode, But the significance of both is, I think, worth emphasising again. Being accused of being a Catholic immediately puts you under a cloud of suspicion. Although Elizabeth at times exercised a degree of toleration, being Catholic was risky, especially if you were thought to be engaged in or sympathetic to missionary activities. That is, missionaries returning to England from the continent to promote Catholicism, which carried an anti-state implication. (laughs) 
because the state and religion were so bound together at the time. However, and somewhat counterintuitively, it's probably the charge of atheism that was the most dangerous one. Atheists were seen as firmly in the anti-state camp, and belief in no god was worse than belief in the wrong god. As the Queen was the head of the Church, to deny the raison d'etre for the Church's existence was a very close cousin to treason. Last time, I touched on the fact that Walter Raleigh was the focal point for a group of atheists that included Marlowe. The group was always a bit amorphous, but as well as Marlowe and Raleigh, was said to include another dramatist and poet, George Chapman, poet Matthew Royden, and the astronomer and mathematician, Thomas Harriot. There was a brief vogue in the early 1900s in scholarship to call this group the School of Night, in a belief that a line from Shakespeare's Love's Labour's Lost that used the phrase referred to that group. This has been broadly discounted now, as there are other readings and more straightforward explanations of the line. The School of Atheism probably was a group of like-minded men who gathered for religious, philosophical and cultural discussions. Some sort of anti-government plotting can never be completely excluded as a possibility. But much of what the group was accused of comes from anti-Catholic and pro-government informers like Richard Baines, whose testimony probably brought Marlowe down. So it's difficult to be certain on the exact purpose and function of this group. On balance, it seems reasonable to believe that Marlowe was genuinely atheistic. His plays certainly question the presence and the role of God in the affairs of men. The arguments contained in Marlowe's plays benefit from his university education. Rhetoric was a key component of that education, being part of the classical skill set and seen as useful for the clergymen, the lawyers and the courtiers that universities expected to produce. Students spent many hours studying and practising rhetorical skills based on the Roman model, and Marlowe transferred these skills to his characters. Much of this in the plays can now sound rather over the top, overawed to us, but it was part of what the Elizabethan expected to see on the stage. The speeches given to characters by Marlowe are often fine examples of Elizabethan rhetoric, the art of speaking effectively. Listen to Tamburlaine's speeches and you can believe that men would follow him to the ends of the earth. There are many rules of rhetoric that Marlowe doesn't follow, but any rule-breaking is only in the service of making the language of argument more effective. Marlowe is concerned only with his characters conveying the truth, or what they believe to be the truth, in the most persuasive and effective way possible. He does this through the use of comparisons, often comparing and contrasting unlikely subjects, classical allusions weighted with meaning for those who could understand the references, and strong and startling imagery. Thanks to his education, Marlowe saw rhetoric as one of the most important keys to power and truth. He disdained the low comedy and clichéd rhetoric of his predecessors. In fact, he wrote such grand and forceful speeches that writers began to parody Marlowe's style after Tamburlaine the Great became famous, seeing Marlowe as the prime example of powerful and sometimes ostentatious, rhetoric. We'll talk a lot more about Tamburlaine's rhetoric when we look in detail at both parts of the play. But Marlowe's plays are not all rhetoric. Arguably, his greatest contribution to English drama was the way that he used blank verse in his plays. You'll remember from when I discussed the first blank verse drama, Gorbiduck, that the use of blank verse was a relatively recent innovation. Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, had first developed it in the 1540s. In Gorbiduck, it resulted in a very static drama, where all the characters spoke in a very formal way, with little distinction in the speech patterns of the characters from the highborn to the lowest. As early adopters of the form, Norton and Sackville's great achievement was bringing it to the stage, but they did not utilise it to its full potential. Marlowe was the first to free the drama from the stiff poetic form and proved that blank verse could be an effective and expressive vehicle for Elizabethan drama. From here on in, blank verse will come up a lot, so it's a good point to make sure that we're all in the same place about what blank verse is. The strict definition of blank verse is poetry written in metrical but unrhymed lines. For the purposes of discussing stage plays, we can add that the metrication of the rhyme is almost always iambic pentameter. 
Iambic pentameter was also not new. Chaucer had first introduced it in the 14th century, but he and others used it in rhymed verse. It was the Tudor playwrights who first introduced the combination of blank verse and iambic pentameter and brought it to the stage. The iamb is Greek for the metrical element of a line of poetry, in this case an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable, which make up the metrical foot, and there are five feet in the line, hence iambic pentameter. So a line of poetry has the rhythm da-dum, 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 da-dum. The most famous example of blank verse iambic pentameter is the soliloquy from Shakespeare's Hamlet, as the young prince considers mortality and the nature of humanity, a speech that truly resonates down the centuries. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them, to die, to sleep no more, and by a sleep we say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep perchance to dream, aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death where dreams may come, when we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must give us pause, there's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. You can get online and see clips of many fine actors taking on that speech and presenting it in quite different ways. Within the iambic pentameter form and metre of the lines, the stress and therefore the meaning can be subtly altered. Which variations work and which are less successful is a question of taste and experience. When I relatively recently saw Ian McKellen perform the part, he gave the speech rather softly, in an introverted way, but the words flowed beautifully. I would certainly prefer that to the sort of declaimed versions that we might have seen in the 1700s and 1800s. I deliberately read it without overstressing the rhythm of the iambic pentameter in an attempt to show that it is a natural sounding form. Natural sounding, it is said, because that rhythm, the da-dum, 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 is that of the human heartbeat, so it resonates with us at a very primal level. Marlowe was the first playwright to capture the musicality of English in his use of blank verse and iambic pentameter. This from Dr Faustus, when Faustus, with the help of the devil, conjures up the image of Helen of Troy, the greatest beauty the world has ever known. O oh, thou art fairer than the evening air, clad in the beauty of a thousand stars. Brighter art thou than flaming Jupiter, when he appeared to hapless Semele more lovely than the monarch of the sky in wanton Arethusia's azured arms. It's a good example of how Marlowe cast off the strict metrication and regularity of the pentameter that Norton and Sackville hadn't dared to break, and how he not only avoids the long rhythmically boring passages of Gorboduck, but reaches for poetic expression that brings scene and character to life. As well as varying syllabic stresses within the line, Marlowe has other tools in his poetic kit that make his work stand out. For example, in the opening lines of the passage I just quoted, O thou art fairer than the evening air, clad in the beauty of a thousand stars, the similarity of the sound between air and stars at the end of the lines, known as poetic assonance, unifies the line in a way that increases the intensity of the sentiment expressed. He gave himself even more poetic freedom by avoiding ending each line with a distinct pause, again as Sackville and Norton had done, and continued a thought or description from one line to the next. This running on within the poetry makes for a more natural speech pattern while still retaining the added intensity of the poetry. So again from Dr Faustus we get Settle thy studies, Faustus, and begin to sound the depth of that thou wilt profess where the first line is, settle thy studies, Faustus, and begin, and carries over to the second line, to sound the depth of that thou wilt profess. Frequently, Marlowe used geographical and classical names merely for the resonant quality of the words themselves. In the following lines, listen out for the repetition of the A and the R sound, 
more lovely than the monarch of the sky in wanton Arethusia's azure arms. Arethusia was a nymph in classical mythology, typical of the classical references that Marlowe peppered his work with, but which would have not been understood by the majority of his audience, who had not been tutored in the classics. But even without full understanding of the meaning, the musical quality of the line appeals to the ear of the listener. This was new and exciting stuff. Now, strong emotions, love, passion, jealousy, anger and violence had a means of expression that suited the strength of the feeling that the playwrights wanted to convey. Emotions that excited their audiences from the illiterate artisans to the educated gentry. When the first folio edition of Shakespeare's plays was being brought together, Ben Jonson wrote a praise poem to the great playwright. It is, in many ways, full of backhanded compliments and worth some unpicking on another occasion. But midway through the poem, Jonson makes some comparisons with other playwrights of the time. For if I thought my judgment were of years, I should commit thee surely with thy peers, and tell how far thou didst our lily outshine, or sporting kid, or Marlowe's mighty line. I've already mentioned the contemporary admiration for John Lilly's ornate language in his courtly plays, and I'll be looking at Kidd and his Spanish tragedy soon. But it is Marlowe that Johnson mentions last, and in undoubtedly admiring tones. Ever since the publication of the folio seven years after Shakespeare's death, Marlowe's use of blank verse and his skills with language have been referred to as Marlowe's mighty line. When Marlowe wrote the prologue to his first major play, Tamburlaine the Great, he set out his stall as a dramatist in no uncertain terms. He said, From jiggling veins of rhyming mother's wits, and such conceits as clownage keeps in pay, will lead you to the stately tent of war, where you shall hear the Scythian Tamburlaine threatening the world with high astounding terms, and scourging kingdoms with his conquering sword. So from the off, Marlowe was letting the world know that he was about to move away from silly verses that were no better than for mothers entertaining their children, or for the jig of the clown. Marlowe was going to take us across the world to different places and astound us with his verse and philosophical ambition. This was an opening statement that gave notice to his ambition to exceed all who had gone before him. A bold statement, indeed, from a young man, and there is a sense of a lot that is very arrogant about Marlowe, but he was a man at the height of his powers. For a few short years he burned brightly, and his plays have long outlived him, and are his best memorial. With Edward Allen, the finest actor of his day, proclaiming these lines, playing them with vitriol, and using this new tool of blank verse to its full extent, it's no wonder that what has been discussed and admired ever since is, indeed, Marlowe's mighty line. Next time, we get properly to look at Tamburlaine the Great, for many Marlowe's finest play and one of his greatest characters, and get to see that mighty line in action. And while you wait for that, please join the Facebook page or group and find us on Instagram or Twitter to keep up to date with the podcast and other theatre-related things. The Facebook page has just passed 2,000 followers, so welcome to everyone who has joined recently, and thanks for sticking with me to those who have been there for a while. Please pass on the word about the podcast far and wide to anyone who you think might be interested in a bit of theatre history. You can find details of other ways to support the podcast at patreon.com or on the website at www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com. It's only me here doing this, so any and all support, whatever form it takes, is very much appreciated. I look forward to your company next time, but if you do have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thobtp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. (laughs) 